Good afternoon from the Porsche Pro over here at Porsche Ocala, and I'm excited to do a how-to video on the all-new 2024 Porsche Panamera. Of course, I was really excited to see this first one when we first got it off the truck. I saw those new headlights and I was ecstatic to go ahead and start doing this video on this car. So of course, let's go ahead and get started on how to work this absolutely beautiful puppy over here. So starting off with the key, of course, which we're not really going to have to use too often is unlocking and locking the car. Of course, unlock with the little button over here and lock the car with the button down beneath it. This one down below, of course, pops the trunk. And then if we flip this puppy over, we do have a panic button as well. If we stick our thumb in here and kind of pull it out like that, that will bring us out the emergency key. Of course, if you need to get inside the car, if either your key fob battery is dead or the car battery itself is dead. But like I said, for the most part, this puppy is just going to stay in your pocket and you'll never pull it out. So unlocking and locking the car normally, all we're gonna do is reach for the door handle that we wanna open, like so. And then locking it, we have these little indentations right over here to touch that. And of course, that's gonna go ahead and lock the car. Right now, I have a key inside there, so it's not gonna do it right away. So I'm gonna go ahead and see. And you can see, it won't lock the car with that key in there. So pretty cool little feature there to save you. You don't have to worry about accidentally trying to lock a key inside the car. Coming over to the trunk, there's a couple of ways to pop the trunk. Of course, we can use the key fob. We can give a little squeeze right over here, as it was before in the previous generation of Panamera. We can see our trunk space is still plenty impressive as well. The other way to do it is with a kick. Now, it's a little interesting to get used to doing it, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty nice. The, the motion you're gonna wanna do with your foot is literally just a forward and back. A lot of people try to do this wave thing, it's not gonna work. So what you do is you line your foot up with the S in the Porsche and go straight down and then go ahead and fast forward and back. And you can see the trunk opens. And what's really cool, they finally brought this back. They took it away for years, is I can do the same thing to close it. Pretty nice stuff there. It is useful in a little pickle if you got your hands full. So the other way to close the trunk and some other things we want to talk about, of course, is how to adjust the opening height of the trunk. Of course, if you do have a low garage, you're just going to want to manually, I'm, even this is too tall for me, I'm too short. So you just move it physically to where you want the trunk to open. Just move it yourself, you're not going to hurt anything. And you're going to press and hold this button that's on here on the left. And it gives us a little kind of two-tone chime, but doot doot, to let us know now this is the maximum height that the trunk is going to open. This other button over here will close, then lock the trunk. Now, I'm not a big fan of using that one because you have to stand near the trunk as it closes. Otherwise, it'll stop halfway. So I'm not a big fan of using that one. I stick with this one, which is just good old close the trunk. That's it. So no problems back over there. Of course, coming over here, gassing up the car. No big difference over here, except it is a lot easier to open than the previous generation, I will say that. We do see, of course, the exclusive fuel cap, which I do like. We just give a little twist uh, counterclockwise, pull it out, and you'll be amazed how many people don't realize this is a little holder for that, so I always like to point that out now. And we go ahead, put that back in, and it is very important that the Porsche is upright, because it looks cooler. That's about it. We go ahead and close that puppy up there. That's about it on the outside of the car, so let's go ahead and jump on in. Now this car just came off the truck and we just performed our PDI inspection to make sure everything came from the factory perfect. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about some of the other buttons. So there are still a lot of plastics and stuff like that because this car is so brand new. So starting off on the left side on the door over here is our door locks, no problems there. And how to set your seat memory. It's a nice little change over here. The previous generation, the later years, they got rid of the little key button down below, which I'm very thankful for. So all we gotta do is set our seats and we're gonna go set and one. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Down over here is going to be our mirror adjustments. So we have, of course, left and right mirror. And this little dial right over here to actually make the adjustment itself. This button right over here is going to fold in our mirrors. This one is very important. So this is our child lock. It looks like a rear window lock, and that is its primary function. But if you do have the four zone climate control option or premium package plus, of course, that also locks the rear AC controls and the rear doors. So anyone sitting in the back seat really has no function and you could have some trapped passengers back there. And so if they can't get out, just take a look over here and make sure that light is not on. That's it. Window controls are pretty self-explanatory. There's really nothing much to discuss right over there. Open up to go up and down to go down. Popping the trunk, the left one pops the trunk.
and our right one closes it. But you gotta hold it for the whole shebang, of course. If you let it go at any point, it will stop the operation. So now we're gonna go ahead and talk about our seat controls. Now, the seat controls, which I do like about Porsche, they really don't change anything, but this one specific finally has the massage seat function so I can show the hidden button for it. A lot of people always have to go through the system to figure out where it is, but there actually is a hidden button over here. So we still have our forward, back, height. I lift up the bottom part of the seat over here or push it down. You can see it kind of scooting back and down. This front one is the tilt of the front part of the seat, so you can see it kind of tilting up, tilting down. This is our thigh support, forward and back. And our pitch of our back over here. And then we have our lumbar support over here. So I always like relating everything. So we have the base part of the seat is all here, right? Well, this is in front of it, and that's in front of the base part of the seat, so that's our leg extension. Pitch of the back is behind everything. That's self-explanatory. Everyone knows where that is. And this is way behind that, which is, of course, for our back. So way in the back. Pushing it forward, extends it out. And since I'm not sitting in it, you might be able to see it. Maybe. It's very subtle. You can see it just coming out there. And then if I push it up, it goes up. It inflates actually an upper cushion. It makes it feel like the cushion's actually moving up where the support is. And down would go down and back to retract it all back. But in the middle here, normally this is a dummy button on any other car, but if you have the massage seats, when you hit this, you'll have a pop-up on the screen over here to actually do your massage. So it's pretty cool, and you can see that. So while I'm doing this video, I'm going to be getting a nice massage. It's going to be great. Coming over here to the lighting operation, they did make it a lot easier, but if you aren't familiar with it, we are going to talk about it. Whenever you see auto, that's all you really need to see. If you want to change out of auto, you have to hit it several times. So you keep hitting it until you get to what you want. Of course, automatic light controls where we're going to leave it. You have low beam, which is manually turning on your headlight. Parking lamps is that dangerous mode. We don't typically use in the United States too much, but it does keep the headlights on even if you turn off the vehicle, so it will drain your battery. So be cautious putting it in that mode. And then, of course, we have our rear fog lights over here. I'm glad they labeled it rear because before they were just fog lights, and uh, now it's a little more distinctive where they actually are. I did have a couple of customers that would say, my front fog lights aren't working. They never did. They were always for the rears only. Of course, popping our hood. Not really much to talk about, of course. But we're going to go ahead and hop on in. Pretty darn cool interior. Now, the start-stop button, it is now a button, is down lower than it usually is. So it's way over here. We put our foot in the brake, start her up, no problems at all. I'm going to close the door because it is toasty out there. And we're going to start off with our turn signal stock. So, of course, this has gotten a little bit easier as well. I mean, turn signals, there's nothing really changing over here. I'm going to turn up the AC a little bit and turn down our radio volume. So we have our lane change movements and then, of course, the full cycle, which will reset itself. Then high beam operation, you pull it towards you to flash, and you can see the little logo right over there. And you push it forward to turn on the automatic high beams, if, of course, your car has it. Just remember, this one is pretty darn well equipped. Never assume anything is, is standard. Down below is gonna be our cruise control function, and this did change a little bit as well. This is gonna be more suited to the Cayenne. So they did kind of go away with some of the different controls. So instead of this being strictly an on-off switch, it's your new mode switch. So whenever you hit this, you'll see what you're currently in. In this case, adaptive cruise control, which is pretty great. This one also has inner drive, so we'll talk about that too. So whenever you turn on adaptive cruise, of course, that's the mode that's going to speed up and slow down based on cars in front of you. And of course, adjust to whatever speed you have it set at. For example, if you set it at 85 miles an hour and some jack wagon cuts you off doing 75, it will automatically slow you down to 75 miles an hour to maintain a set distance, which is controlled with this little switch over here. You can see these squares getting closer. So as the squares get closer, that means the closer you're going to follow. But it maintains that distance until either you decide to change lanes or the guy that cut you off gets out of the way and it speeds you right back up again. So it kind of handles all that. The next mode is called speed limiter. I typically don't use this mode, but it's essentially a, a speed governor. So if you're going through a school zone and you have a habit of getting a ticket there and you don't want to have to do that, well, if you set the speed limiter to 30 miles an hour, you can go between anywhere between zero and 30, but you can't go above it. It literally won't let you. Pretty cool. The other controls, of course, once we have 
I, I always say this is how we're going to control it. We're in adaptive cruise. You go to whatever speed you want. Now, the controls change slightly, as we mentioned. We're at 75 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour, and we're going to lift it up instead. That sets the speed. You can do up or down to set the speed. And if I want to go higher in speed, we raise it up. If we want to go lower in speed, we drop it down. The other controls are a little bit easier to see. We have cancel, which is the same thing as giving a gentle tap on the brake. It's just pushing it forward. And resume, which resume is what you have previously, is pulling it towards you. That's it there. We've already mentioned the follow distance here. Of course, quite variable. Each square, I get this question a lot, is dependent on what speed you're going. At low speed, it's about a car length. At higher speeds, it is about two to three car lengths. So it, there is really no set distance to what it is. This little button over here at the end, of course, due to new mandates, all the safety systems have to be kind of defaulted to on, and that does include lane departure warning, which I know a lot of people aren't too keen on. But in order to disable it, we just press and hold this button that's here at the bottom. And you'll have that little icon right over there. Get a slash through it, and that's that icon right there. That means the lane departure warning, or I call it the frog, isn't gonna warn us, and if we drift out of the lane, it's not gonna try to steer us back or anything. And then if we want it again, we just kick it on and it's back on again. That's all the controls for cruise control. There is a little bit more in the system because this has InnoDrive. But what I really like what they did is they separated the functions of InnoDrive. So before it was all or nothing. But now you can decide, well, I don't want it to adapt to speed limits, but I would like it to adapt to sharp corners or like topography information. And I do want lane keeping where it maintains your lane composure in there. You can choose exactly what you want, which is pretty darn cool. I do like that. From there, of course, we're gonna to go to the left side of the steering wheel. And you gotta remember, this is not a setup video, so I'm really kind of glancing over actual settings of the car. We have our voice commands right over here. A gentle tap, and you'll get this response with a little chime. And you can see also on the dash, it says, I'm listening. So she is currently listening to me. If I felt like I made a mistake or like I'm doing right now, I'm kind of rambling on. Obviously, it's not going to be able to process this. I can just hit it again, and it cancels it. In theory. <laughs> but she's trying to listen and process all of everything that I'm saying. So from here, we do have next station. This button I typically program as previous station, so nothing to worry about there. We have volume for the radio or whatever you're currently listening to. So if you're on a phone call and it's too loud or anything like that, we just literally hit that little, we just adjust the volume while it's talking to us or anything and that's it. From there, of course, we have our paddle shifters. Those are much harder to describe uh, for their function if you don't already know what they do. So you have to be familiar with how to drive like a manual transmission car and know when a car light, when you should be shifting a car. So we're just going to briefly talk about it. This is how you downshift and this is how you upshift. That's it there. If you pull one, it will temporarily go into manual mode. And if you leave, it'll go back to automatic. No problems at all. Most people won't use this function. But if you want it to stay in manual mode, we're going to talk about that in just a bit. Over on the right side of the steering wheel, we have answer and hang up phone calls. Of course, once you have your phone hooked up. This little section right over here is probably, in my opinion, the most confusing section of the car. And I'm going to go ahead and move the steering wheel down a little bit. So see if I can see the heads-up display. Probably not. So this little, dial, this little button here at the end is how I choose what I want to customize. So right now you see this white little highlight that's around the, the circle. Now it's back. That means I'm going to be customizing this center section here. So I'm going to go ahead and spin this little wheel and it changes what my screen looks like. And I can keep cycling through. There's all sorts of different views. This one shows us what the active cruise control sensors see. This one shows us our map, a big map. This one's the really cool one if you have it. This is the night vision. I wanna use this at nighttime to see if there's any critters that walk around a parking lot at night. That'd be kind of cool. And then of course we have a reduced kind of calm mode. Now, not every page is customizable. Obviously, you can always change what the center sees. But in anything that has the three tiles, as I refer it to, if I hit this little button here again, now we can see it's on the right. Oh, well, now if I spin the wheel, it changes what I see on the right-hand side. So we have our trip computer, sports car, and a lap timer, of course, if you have that, and then our music. And this is where things get a little bit more confusing. If you push this button in while we're on audio, for example, 
it gives us some sub menus. So check this out. I can see FM. I can change my source from here. I can see all list of all the stations from here. I can change everything. I'm not a big fan of doing it over here because I do find it a little bit more complex than just coming over to the main infotainment screen or using voice commands, but you can. That's a nice feature to have. Coming over here to the left-hand side, of course, we do have different selections over here. Right now, we don't know what the speed limit is because we're in a parking lot. The best rule of thumb is to remember the topmost and the bottommost pages, you can't really customize what's on the outer circles. They just don't allow it. But pretty much every other page, you can customize it to an extent. It's pretty cool. And then if you ever have this little guy right over here, I use it for simply, if you have a message like this, this is a scary message that people always see. They think, oh, something's wrong with the car. It just means you have a door open. So I can just get out of that. And then close the door. But that's what that little back button does. It gets you out of whatever's going on. Now we come over here, of course, to our drive mode. Now, this is a Porsche after all. So, of course, this is our most important stuff. Whenever you turn the car, the car always resorts to a normal drive mode. Everything's nice and comfy. Everything's nice and soft. No problems at all. I'm going to peel off the screen protector so we have left glare. And that's it. If I twist this over to the left, we enter nothing. If we twist it over to the right, we have Sport. Now, if you don't have Sports Chrono, you will not have a Sport Plus. That's okay. Nothing really crazy. Sport, of course, sharpens up the throttle response. It opens up our exhaust note, and you can even see some of the other changes it does. So we can see it adjusts our suspension. It stiffens that up a little bit. It lowers the suspension a little bit, opens up our sports exhaust. Start stop is disabled, and that's pretty cool. Then we go into Sport Plus, and you can see now the car is dropping all the way down. Chassis in Sport Plus, so super stiff. Sports exhaust is still on. This is going to hold throttle response or hold their gear even longer. Throttle response will be even sharper. It even keeps the throttle body open in between gear changes. And when you let off the gas, they have quicker response. Pretty cool little changes that they do on the car. Then we have a sport response button. Now, I like to use this button mainly when I'm in normal mode. I'm just cruising along, no problems at all. And I'm like, oh crap, I got to take that exit. I didn't pay attention. Well, you can hit this button. It essentially puts the car into a crazy sport mode for about 20 seconds, and you can cancel at any time once you've made your maneuver or just leave it on. Of course, I can't condone using, you know, street light uh, racing shenanigans, but this would be a good, useful button to use that for if you were to, of course, be at a racetrack in a closed circuit. From there, we talk about our windshield wipers. Luckily, nothing has changed with the windshield wipers. All I do, I do my little test. I push it all the way down, it springs back up. That tells me I'm in the off position because it tells me if I push it down, it'll only do one time, which it does. I just go into intermittent. That's automatic. That's where I leave it. Unless you're going through car wash, of course. Then I'm gonna lift this up maybe one, maybe two. That's the sensitivity of your automatic windshield wipers. That's it there. And obviously, just like any other car, we pull the whole stock towards us if we want to spritz. So now we're done with the whole steering wheel area. If your car does have a heated steering wheel at the bottom spoke, and I'm not flipping you off, I promise, we put a little finger right here and we push the button. And you can see our heated steering wheel is now on. And if I hit it again, it turns it off. That's a pretty rare option to have, but it's nice to have. Glad this one has it so I can showcase it. Our gear selector. So if you have a Cayenne or have it played with a little bit, you're already going to be familiar with this. Same thing with the Tycons and 911s have it down over here in the center console, but it's all the same premise. We have P for park, very simple. That is also an emergency stop function. So if I am driving along and I press and hold that, it will stop the car, unlock all the doors, turn on the lights, and call Porsche's roadside assistance. But for the most part, if I'm looking to control this guy right over here, going to reverse, neutral, drive, etc., the easiest way to operate the whole thing is don't even look at it. Instead, what I do is I look at this little icon over here in the right. I have this tiny little blue arrow right over here, and that tells me where I got to move it. So if I look at that little blue arrow, it tells me, well, I want to go into reverse. I'm just going to lift this up. Oh, now I'm in reverse. Everything is happy. Well, now if I want to go into drive, I know I got to push it all the way down. And that's it. That tells me what gear I'm in. It, this tells me everything. Well, what if you're going through one of those pull-through car washes and you need neutral? Well, that tells me all I'm going to do, instead of lifting all the way up, I'm just going to go a little bit. And now I'm in neutral. Pretty useful if you just look there. Now, I did mention how to put the car into manual mode. So what you're going to do for that is you're going to put the car into drive, like you normally would, and then you're going to hold this down for about a second. And it puts manual shift mode 
uh, enable. So that means I can use the paddles and it will not return to an automatic mode unless I come back over here and hold it down again. Putting it back in park. That's it, so there are some changes, of course, to get used to on the car. This car does have the heads-up display. Customizing that is a little more interesting because you have to be in the driver's seat to really see it, but it still uses this little control switch right over here. I just can't show it on camera too well. You can just see the wide highlight there. It's very difficult to see. But essentially, you'd push in this button, and you can adjust the brightness settings, height, rotation, stuff like that. Uh, if you are using polarized glasses, that is another common thing I get. Uh, that's probably why you're not able to see it if you're in the driver's seat, if you have the option, of course. So make sure, be aware, polarized glasses, uh, they stop reflected light, and lo and behold, the heads-up display is a reflected light. Coming over here to the center console, once again, we get into easy stuff, thankfully. Everything starts getting easier from here, folks, I promise. We come over here to AC. So auto, just like our headlights, windshield wipers, high beams, auto is your friend. It takes care of all the work for you. You just say what temperature you want using these two switches, and the car will handle the rest. It says you want 74 degrees, but it's really hot out. Well, we're going to have to blast the fan speed. But if I turn up the temperature, you can see the fan speeds are dying down because it's just not necessary to have to blast you anymore. These inner switches, if you're not keen on using auto, is how you adjust the fan speed yourself. That's it there. This little middle switch is how if I want max AC, I'm just going to go ahead and push that up. I don't want it anymore. I pull it back down. And I don't want AC at all. I just want fans. I would pull it down again. That's it there. So literally for the most part, folks, leave it in auto. Set your temperature. You're done. Leave it. You have your ventilated and heated seats on either side, of course. Sync stands for synchronize. It matches whatever the passenger is it'll match it to my driver's side so as you can see now if i change it it adjusts the passenger side as well but if i adjust the passenger side it turns it off i typically leave sync on if somebody's in your passenger seat they feel too cold too hot it'll already disable it. you really don't have to worry about it front defrost for the curved windscreen is this one the rear defrost is this one air recirculation is this button right over here and there is a little bit more settings i typically don't hit these too much but it's climate menu if you leave it in auto, you really don't have to worry about these too much. But this is where you come to to adjust our digital vents. All of them are digital on this car. It used to be just the two central ones before, but now it's all four of them on this car. And you can choose where you want to move them, what you want to do with them. I usually just kind of point them off to the side or up. And then they don't blow on me. And there we go. Air quality. This is where we come to if you have the ionizer to turn that on. If you're an allergy-filled mess like I am, it's very nice. And rear is also where you're going to come to, to, of course, if you've got little ones in the rear, you can lock the rear window. They can't change anything, but you could change it for them. So pretty cool. That's all the control over here. Our last little switch is a very simple one, our volume. Obviously, I can't play music too loudly for copyright reasons, I guess. So that's it there. It says volume and pushing it down would mute the radio. Doing it again would unmute it. We do have a new wireless phone charging tray. Please use this carefully, because I know in the previous generation, I did see a lot of these get uh, damaged due to uh, improper use. All you do is you kind of just push up on this until it opens up all the way. And if you want to close it, you don't pull it. Just push it again. That's it. You lay your phone down in there, of course, is you, if your case is compatible with wireless phone charging. You just lay it in there. You'd have a pop-up on the screen. You'll have a pop-up on your phone saying wireless phone charging is occurring, and you're good to go. We do have two USB Type-Cs over here for charging your phone. There are more in the back, and they did carry over one of my favorite features from the Cayenne. There's actually a teeny little air vent in there to help keep this area cold. If you're familiar with technology, wireless phone charging does get your phone quite hot, so having a nice little cooler in there helps keep the phone nice and cool so it doesn't overheat, especially if you try to wirelessly phone charge with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Uh, I highly recommend against that. From there, we're almost done with all the physical buttons. Center console, we just lift this, no problems at all. We do have this kind of neat little divider they give us. You can kind of slide it wherever you want to kind of separate the center console. And we have a 12 volt socket and then a little light right over here. That's it there, literally nothing else. And then our overhead console is also pretty darn easy as well. You just tap on a light if you want it. Sorry, depth perception is a little screwed up. So if I'm doing things slow, it kind of throws me off looking through the camera. This one turns on all the lights inside the car, including rear lights. 
Rear lights, lo and behold, turns on only the rear lights or on or off. Then we have our SOS button in case you get a flat tire, run out of gas. Of course, that My Porsche account, that Car Connect, you might hear being called My Porsche, Porsche Connect. That is all this umbrella account stuff that your dealership should be setting up for you, uh, which does include your roadside assistance. So very important to make sure they do that for you. And I hopefully they are logging it in for you as well. From here, we have our front moonroof controls. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this in the direction I want it to go. So this shade opens up that way. So I'm going to push the button straight back and the moonroof opens. Now it's awfully bright, but I'm going to do the same thing again. And it opens up the glass. I'm going to close it because it's really bright. If I wanted it to vent upwards, I push it up and I vent it. And if I push it up again, it comes back down. And I'm going to close it by pushing forward. You're literally, the logic here is push it in the direction you want it to go. You want the screen to go back, push it back. You want the glass to go back, push it back again. That's it. The rear screen opens up in an opposite direction. It opens up coming towards the front like that. So if I want to open, I hit this one. Sorry if I'm making anybody sick with the camera movement. I hit the other button to close it. And that's it. Now we get into the main infotainment system. And luckily, if you're familiar with the new Cayenne, this is exactly the same from what I can see at all, at literally every point. So I'm only gonna focus on the big three and then a very light point on vehicle. If you notice the symbols on the left match the symbols that are over here. They have the same functionality. So if I hit navigation, great. We have all these different symbols over here and what the heck do they do? You don't have to worry about them. All we do, for everything with navigation is we come to here for search for destination. If where you want to go isn't already here, which is where your recent destinations would be, we come over here to search. I'm going to search up the greatest restaurant of all time. I'm going to crack a small joke over here. Cracker Barrel, if you want to give me a, you know, a sponsorship over here, you know, I do get paid in lemon pepper grilled trout. But I have some secrets. If I were to just immediately hit over here, it would take me right there. No problems at all. Please drive to the route shown. And it tells me, please drive to the route shown. It tells me what time I'm going to arrive, how far it is away, how long it's going to take me, and there's no traffic along the route. Great. If I want to stop it, I hit that. But I'm going to do it again. I'm going to type in Cracker Barrel, but I'm going to do a secret. I don't show a lot of people this, so this is kind of fun. Instead of immediately hitting on the destination over here on the right, I'm instead going to hit OK. And now I have these three little dots to the right-hand side, and I get my Yelp reviews. And you can see it on the map where everything is, so you can get a better idea. Well, I'm going to hit these three little dots, and this gives me some more stuff. It gives me phone numbers. Gives me hours of operation. Inside images of the place, usually food and stuff like that. Hopefully nothing inappropriate. And then we even have street views. So if you're trying to see, oh, is that the good chilies, Or do you want to go to the other one? You can see, oh, is this the right one? Does that look right to you? You can see it. So it's a pretty cool little function, a hidden function on navigation. But in short, that's literally navigation as a whole. You search for a destination, choose where you want to go, and that's it. Media is still the most complex page, but they have made it easier, in my opinion. So whenever we're on media, I always say the best way to think of it is I am currently playing FM radio and listening to 93.7. If I wanted to go to the next station, I would hit next station. If I wanted previous, I'd go previous. If I wanted a favorite a station, I would favorite that little star right over there, and it would go to my favorites. Obviously, these can be all rearranged. That's okay. These are your sources. This is what you want to do, and this is how you change it. That's really the, all that comes down to it. So since I'm playing FM, what if I wanted a list of FM? I would hit list. And now I have a list of FM stations. That's it. What's nice is that now allow me to favorite from the list. They used to not allow that. So I can go next station, previous station. I can favorite it right from the list. I can do whatever I want. And that's it. I can choose Sirius XM and all channels. And it's the same thing. If I'm on list... There's my list of all Sirius XM stations. Play is just what's currently playing. 
Ooh, Merle Haggard. Search as if you can't find a station. Let's say you want to listen to Yacht Rock Radio. They always move that station around. I search Yacht. Oh, there it is. I could favorite it right from here as well. That's the most complex page, guys. That's it. Bose, if you have the Bose or Burmeister, this is where you'd come to to adjust the treble, bass, surround, everything like that. For Bose, I'm a keen fan of minus two. I don't know why I'm showing settings on this video, but, you know, minus two, plus two, just like that. No linear. I'm not a big fan of that. It's supposed to help with compressed music. I think it makes it hissy. That's it there. Phone is still probably the easiest page because once you have your phone hooked up, you go to start search, go to the Bluetooth menu on your phone. Keypad is keypad. Recent calls are your, or call history is your history of calls that you made, missed or made, and contacts are all your contacts. That's it there. The little vehicle page, which we briefly talk about, we have drive, which is all the stuff that changes with the drive mode. So I don't really mess with this stuff. Once you change it, you're pretty much good. The assistance one is one that we really do like to be a little more familiar with. Once again, this is where we're going to come to to customize if you have InnoDrive, the functions of InnoDrive, or Adaptive Cruise. Additional functions is where all your other safety stuff is. So, speed warning gives you kind of a red highlight if you're speeding the speed limit of the road that you're on. doesn't make any sounds or anything. If you want the sound, you have to turn that on. Warning and brake assist. Of course, if you are approaching a car way too quickly and it says, hey, you're about to crash into that guy, it can, of course, intervene and prevent the accident. Lane keep assist is if you start drifting from the lane and stuff like that, it'll kind of give you a little bump back. Uh, it pretty much waits for you to make the mistake before correcting you, but you can turn that on and off and adjust the parameters right over here. Lane chain assist, people get confused with that. It's just your blind spot, guys. You can see it in the mirror over there. Intersection assist is pretty cool. If you're entering an intersection and some jack wagon was running a red light, well, if the car can prevent the accident and prevent you getting T-boned, it will see that occurring and slam on the brakes and prevent that accident from happening, which is nice. Distance warning, you can customize, of course, all the distances. And emergency stop function is, of course, that one that I mentioned about P holding P. Uh, of course, if you're driving the car, if the driver becomes incapacitated, if you're on the passenger side, you can press and hold P with one hand and steer the car safely with the other. It really helps out there. We have just a lot of other things. Proactive occupant protection, of course. Uh, if it needs to tighten up the seatbelts, if it detects a possible accident, it can do that. If you start getting a little wavy in your steering, it'll tell you, hey, you need to take a break. Night vision assist, of course, works really nice. If you do live in a very hot climate, uh, you got to remember skin temperature primarily is about 78 degrees. So if your nighttime is above 78 degrees, eh, it might not work all the time, but you can still always see them. It's pretty cool. Trip computer is just trips. That's it. And comfort is where I come to to adjust my ambient lighting. Which they did drastically change on this car, which I do love. Let's see if we can show it off on the sides over there. It's just too bright. It's too bright out to really see that. But guys, that is the all-new 2024 Porsche Panamera. I'm pretty excited to get this video out. I'm glad we were able to do it. I am going to upload a video here shortly on how to do the parking assistant functions. The last little buttons we're going to talk about are hazards. I do, it is important to always know where that is. And, of course, our traction control. We do also have garage door buttons back. Probably the happiest thing my, ha my happy self can ever see. We brought back the garage door buttons for Homelink, for your garage door motors. So you hit the little button, choose what you want it to do. Uh, that's a learning curve. If you guys ever have trouble with garage doors, uh, try to get in contact with me. I got to know the brand uh, and a lot of other things. But I do want to thank you guys for staying along. And this was a longer video. I'm just pretty darn excited to do one on this car. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to comment, uh, send me a message, whatever you guys want, or have any suggestions for a video, let me know. Take care. Bye.